our first session for today, which is gene therapy approaches for CCDS. Um, this session will be conducted um, as a hybrid session. So we have three virtual speakers and one in-person speaker in this session. At this time, I'd like to introduce um, Gabriela fernandez Pires. Um, Gabriela is pursuing a PhD in the, in the lab of Dr. Brazant. Um, the goal of her thesis is to develop a new strategy for treatment of CTD by gene therapy in a rat model. Um, she will be presenting today on an AAV strategy for treatment of CTD in this rat model. Gabriella, can you hear us? Yes, and you can hear me? Yes, we can. The slides are fine as well? Yes, they are. Thank you. Okay. So. Thank you for the introduction, and Gabriella, I'm the PhD student of Olivier Bresson. And today I will present the AV strategy to treat creatine transported deficiency in the SLC 6i8KI rat. So, as you know, creatine is synthesized by the two step pathway by the enzyme AGAT and GAMT, and then is creatine is uptake by the specific transporter, the creatine transporter. The main function of creatine is the recycling of ATP by the creatine, phosphocreatine, and creatine kinase system. Other roles have, has been proposed for creatine. It can be a neurotransmitter as it can be synthesized in the neurons, released in an action potential manner, and act as a partial agonist um, of uh, postsynaptic GABA A receptor. But also, creatine can, uh, is one of the main cellular osmolites in the central nervous system. So, as Lara already presented, we use our Nokian rat model as a tool to develop a novel therapy for CTD. We choose gene therapy by adeno associate virus as a strategy approach to treat the CTD. Our goal was to inject our rats. In, uh, in order to reestablish the expression of a functional creatine transporter in different, different brain cells, as, uh, such as in the blood brain barrier, but also in neurons or oligodendrocytes. This may allow the reestablishment of brain parity, improve of behavioral tests, or other features of CTV. So, what we previous uh, already but in the previous results, we observed that we could transduce um, in, the rat, uh, in the rat brain at uh, up to 16 weeks post-injection after intravenous or intra intratecal injection, uh, AV vectors transducing fluorescent proteins such as GFIP and CHERRY, but also um, transduce uh, um, uh, the creatine transporter coupled with a flag. And as you can observe here, we can saw a nice uh, transduction of a uh, Burkinje cell with uh, GFP and also with m Sherry after uh, 16 weeks post-injection by intravenous injection or the creatine transporter with a flag by intrathecal injection in the cerebellum. Um, we also observe that we could uh, um, we could recover or prevent some symptoms in individuals uh, KI rats, and we had a better recovery if we could supplement uh, we give to the rats creatine. Here in the left side, you can see the body, the follow-up of our bodies, uh, of the body weight of our animals, KI and wild types. And I, I just highlighted here um, two animals that were the two animals that were injected KI and here that were injected with uh, the creatine um, treatment in the drinking water. And these animals had the, the higher uh, body weight gain. And um, these animals there and these three were also the, the same animals that perform better with more distance move in the open field test. Concerning the MRS, we, we observed that these two animals here with the, the red arrow 
had a slight increase in the um, uh, creatine concentration in the phosphocreatine and the total creatine uh, in the hippocampus. And uh, were the same observation, the same tendency was observed in the wild type that, that were injected with the EV uh, creatine transporter. So since we had only the uh, only um, uh, a recovery, since we had only an individual recovery uh, or prevention of some symptoms, our aim was to increase the titration of our virus up to 10 to the 13 the vector genome per kilo to try to increase the replenishment of brain creatine and the prevention of other CTD symptoms. So to restore our functional uh, creatine transporter on the blood gradient within the CNS, what we did was to inject our wild type and KI rat at 11 days post injection by uh, intrathecal um, um, by intrathecal delivery, and we sacrificed the animals at two different time points at five and 14 weeks post injection. Starting the five weeks post injection, a subgroup of male KI rats inject where they receive uh, the co-treatment with creatine in the drinking water. At five, at uh, 12 weeks post-injection, we perform, we start to perform some behavioral data, uh, behavioral tests, sorry. And before harvesting, we, we did the proton MRS scanner. So now I will focus to the results at five weeks post-injection. And what we observed was that we could uh, observe a widespread transduction in different regions of the brain. As you can see here in red are the anti-flag, so the uh, creatine uh, transport that coupled with a flag that we can saw in uh, immunostaining in this region over there in the olfactory bulb, in the cortex, so this zone highlighted in blue, in the cerebellum, as you can see here, this. Uh, uh, lobule that uh, uh, we have po some positive cells uh, like uh, Burkinger cells, the neurons, but also some positive cells in the granular layer. And also in the medulla oblongata, that is this region over there of the brain. Now I will pass to the results that we, uh, we saw at uh, 14 weeks post injection. And uh, we follow the animals and we body weight uh, once per week. And uh, what we observed was that our, a our AV injected and creatine supplemented KE animals here in orange, the orange group, present a significant increase in, body in the body weight compared to the male KE not injected here in green. Here in the right side of my graph, I just put uh, the all the uh, every replicate of our K, uh, KI injected plus creatine, and the high highlighted here the three that had the, the higher body weight gain, and uh, which I will highlight also in other results that I will present in the next slides. Uh, we, we look at the, at the creatine to creatine in urine ratio. And as you can see here, our male KI injected present a decrease in the creatine to creatine uh, ratio in urine and an increase uh, compared to the KI uh, not injected here in green. And uh, concerning in the plasma, we had an increase, a significant increase uh, of uh, creatine uh, concentration in our KI injected compared to the not injected. As uh, I, I showed you before at five weeks post-injection, we had the, the same uh, transduction in the same regions, as you can see here in the olfactory bulb, in the, um, in the cortex, in the cerebellum, where you can appreciate a, a Burkinje cell uh, that was positive for the anti flag antibody, and here in the medulla oblongata. As I told you before, we, um, uh, before harvesting, we performed the proton uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy, and we observed that our AV injected and creatine supplemented KI, that you can see here in the graph in orange, and the AV injected wild type animals here in red, 
present a small, a small slight increase in creatine, phosphocreatine and total creatine in the hippocampus, in the region of the hippocampus, as in the cerebellum. Um, we perform also some behavioral tests, and, um, such as the open field, and here we could uh, show that uh, the uh, AD um, injected KI plus or minus creatine uh, move, move more and with more, this, um, with more velocity compared to the KI not injected, as you can see here in, uh, in green and also there. The same uh, tendency was the interesting uh, um, uh, uh, results was that uh, our uh, AB injected KI plus or minus creatine, so the vi violet and orange, um, reached the same level for, as the wild type animals. Uh, the same tendency uh, was observed also in the circular corridor test where they move more distance with more velocity and has the tendency to move more versus not moving compared to always to the male kind not injected. We also look uh, to the total time duration during grooming and what we observed was that our uh, AD injected and creatine supplemented uh, kind animals so a tendency to spend less time doing grooming more time in rearing, uh, rearing supported and unsupported. As you can see here in this graph and over there, always compared to the our no, uh, knocking not injected. So with this, we could, uh, in conclusion, we could uh, see the transduction of our creatine transporter coupled with a flag in different region of the brain of our CAI. Uh, males injected. We could also saw a significant increase, um, a significant increase in the body weight gain with a reduced creatine to creatinine ratio in urine and an increased creatine concentration in plasma. And we observe um, a, a rescue in the locomo locomotor activity. Concerning the proton magnetic resonance spectroscopy, so far there is only a non significant tendency of creatine increase. So, in conclusion, the take home message is that our AV, AV, AV driven strategy aiming to correct CTD in our in vivo rat model is encouraging, but more work is needed to increase the efficiency of the creatine transporter flag transduction. And with this, I would like to thank uh, all the people working at this project and also our collaborators at Shuv at the PFL and you for your attention. Thank you so much, Gabriella. That was a wonderful talk. Um, I'm sure there's um, several questions that will come up in the Q&A session, so I'm looking forward to it. Um, I'd like to invite Dr. Laura Baroncelli. Um, yes, Dr. Baron hi, hi, Laura. Hi. Um, Laura joins us from uh, the Neuroscience Institute of CNR in Pisa, Italy. She has published several papers on the study of CTD in mouse models. Um, she also works very closely with our association through the Gene Therapy Consortium and is involved in several initiatives with us. Um, today, today Laura is going to be presenting on some of the work um, conducted in her lab on um, creatine transporter deficiency. So, Laura, over to you now. Okay, thanks a lot for the kind introduction, Sangeeta, and good morning, everyone. I would like to thank, first of all, ACD for the organization of this beautiful symposium, and I'm deeply sorry for not being there in person, but some issues held me in Italy, so I have to go virtual one more, again, one more time. Well, here I think I don't need to describe the role of creatine in the brain and the critical picture of CTD, right? So I go straight to the point. One of the most ambitious uh, objectives of the lab is to try to find a cure for CTD, and we are now investigating gene therapy as a potential disease-modifying treatment. Uh, indeed, at least in theory, CTD is uh, uh, an ideal target for gene replacement therapy because it's a monogenic condition, 
because the reversibility of the pathological state due to creatine deficiency has been demonstrated in agat and gum disorders previously, because the moderate uh, cognitive symptoms displayed by heter heterozygous females suggest that the CTD phenotype has a dose-dependent relationship with the level of transporter respection, but also because there is no evidence in the, in the previous literature, at least so far, of toxic effects deriving from an overexpression of the creatine transporter. Well, as you know, the pipeline of uh, uh, therapeutic development needs to start at the preclinical level, and we are using this mouse model carrying the ubiquitary deletion of the exons 5, 6, and 7 um, of the SLC6A gene that we have generated eight years ago by now in collaboration with uh, the group of Cornelius Gross. And as you can see from this table, uh, the loss of function um, of the creatine transporter causes a marked depletion of creatine in the brain, but also in peripheral tissues of mutant animals. Uh, importantly, knockout mice share the clinical picture of CTD patients, including cognitive dysfunction, autistic light behavior, and the epileptic phenotype. Indeed, we have performed a wide battery of behavioral tasks, and we found that the CRT knockout mice display a global deterioration of working memory in the Y maze, object recognition memory, and spatial memory in the uh, Morris water maze, but also an amplification of stereotype behaviors as a using the self-grooming and the rotary task. Moreover, using uh, video AG recordings, we also observed that the knockout animals showed spontaneous seizures and the more uh, pronounced accessibility to kinetic acid challenge. So in our gene therapy project, this set of results represents important normative data and behavioral as well as EG measures can be effective endpoints to assess the beneficial effects of gene replacement. But we also identified uh, one more quantitative biomarker of brain function, just to increase the pool of objective readouts that we can use for therapeutic development. And in particular, we used uh, optical imaging of intrinsic signal that is a non-invasive technique providing an indirect measure of brain activity. This is basically very similar to the bold signal of functional MRI, because the two main sources of the intrinsic signals are the transient deoxygenation of hemoglobin, in the active cell cerebral tissue and the subsequent changes in the local blood flow. As you can see from this image, active cortical regions appear dark because basically they reflect less light with respect to no active areas. And we demonstrated that, that uh, cortical hemodynamic responses evoked by a visual stimulus uh, are able to effectively discriminate between mutant and wild type animals at different ages, indicating that the assessment of brain metabolic consumption might be used to test the brain response to therapeutic intervention. Here, uh, Okay, here let me, let me make a quick detour about what we are doing from the clinical validation of this biomarker. There is this technique called the functional near infrared spectroscopy that basically allows to perform in humans the same measurements done in mice with iOS imaging. Of course, this is a totally non invasive technique based uh, on the use of optodes, uh, sensor and detectors, which are uh, placed in a, in a textile cap. And since the classic paradigm uh, for, visual, uh, for visual stimulation consisting in the combination of a, of a black and white checkerboard, as you can see here, and the gray baseline is quite boring to see for a long time, or even, or even for 10 minutes, you know, we devised a novel procedure blending the checkerboard and the gray pattern with the commercial cartoon. And we compared the hemodynamic responses evoked by the standard paradigm and our cartoon-based stimulus. And um, what we found uh, is that uh, um, our novel stimulating paradigm is effective in eliciting a visual response in the occipital cortex of adults and, and children. Here you can see the grand averages across the children with typical development uh, of uh, changes in total oxygenated and the oxygenated hemoglobin in the different conditions. The panel A 
uh, I hope you can see my, my, my pointer, the panel A describes the evoked response to the standard paradigm. And as expected, statistical analysis revealed the significant main effect of the checkerboard stimulus with respect to the blank simulation for all metrics. But in panel B and C, you can see uh, significant changes of hemoglobin species in response to the cartoon stimulus as well. And importantly, we also found that the amplitude of cortical activation was independent from the cartoon employed. A comparable response indeed uh, was elicited both when the movie was fixed a priori by, by the experimenter, by us, the cartoon fixed condition which is described in panel B, and when the cartoon was, was instead freely selected by the, by the tested subject in the cartoon chosen condition that you can see in panel C. Thus, this can be a novel method for measuring visually evoked cortical activity with NIRS that ensures an elevated compliance of young subject because, of course, you know, seeing a, a cartoon can be uh, entertaining, high quality reliability of measurements, and this preservation of, of inter-subject variability. And now we would like to start the evaluation uh, of, ch children, of children with CTD, but we need some adjustments uh, to, to, to our simulating paradigm. Um, well, going back to gene therapy, uh, our goal is to assess whether the intraventricular injection of a viral vector carrying the functional copy of the SLC6A8 gene can rescue the pathological endophenotype of knockout mice. So as preliminary work, we cloned the human uh, SLC6A8 coding sequence carrying uh, the C-terminal NHA tag under the CAG promoter, which is a strong synthetic promoter typically used to drive high levels of gene expression in mammalian tissues. And we, ref we verified CRT protein expression and creatine uptake in X cells and fibroblasts um, from CRT uh, knockout mice transfected with this plasmid. As you can see from the green bars here and here, creatine levels in cells treated with the plasmid were significantly increased, while the incubation with the guanidinopropionic acid, which is the uh, specific inhibitor of creatine transporter, made creatine dropping almost to zero. Thus, we packed uh, this plasmid into an AAV backbone, obtaining a high titer um, preparation, 10 to 13 uh, vector genome, uh, viral genome per uh, milliliter, and we injected two microliters of this vector in the ventricles of neonatal mice, and uh, two weeks later, we assessed the expression of the transgenic uh, CRT protein in the brain using the Western blot. What we found is that viral delivery leads to the expression of CRT protein in the brain of both knockout and wild-type mice. The yellow arrow here points to the band corresponding to the transporter, which is not present in the negative, not injected controls. And importantly, we found that the exogenous CRT protein is properly working since brain creating levels, as you can see here, significantly increase in the brain of injected animals again, well-type and knockout. Moreover, using immunohistochemistry in a different uh, group of mice, of course, we observed the widespread expression of the transgenic CRT throughout the brain with a very good diffusion of the virus along the anterior posterior axis. So, so far so good, but of course, seeing things are never so simple. And uh, the bad news is that a high percentage of uh, injected animals died about three weeks after the AAV treatment. And when we looked at the brain of uh, surviving mice that we decided to harvest in order to see what's, what's happening there, we found a severe pattern of cellular degeneration, enlargement of brain ventricles, and inflammation. Here I have to apologize for the poor quality of these images, but this experiment has been done in Russia during the period of high COVID restriction. But anyway, I'd say that uh, the thing are, is quite plain to see. But despite the appearances, I'm convinced that uh, um, this data provided a crucial piece of information. Indeed, in contrast to what previously reported in the literature, at least for the heart tissue so far, we found that the overexpression of CRT in the brain results can result in over-toxic effects, indicating that the safety window on gene therapy is narrower than expected. Uh, so we hypothesized that, that sorry, 
uh, we hypothesized that the, the toxicity emerged in our experiments was due to a cellular overload of creatine, and that the optimization of the viral construct might overcome this issue, providing a better compromise between the expression levels of exogenous six, SLC 6A8 in single cells and the number of cells infected by the virus in the whole brain. Thus, we decided to replace the strong CAG promoter with JET, which is a synthetic promoter known in the literature for showing, at least in theory, a weaker activity with respect to CAG. And we performed intraventricular injections of the jet virus at different uh, dilutions in order to build a dose response curve. What we found is that, again, CRT overexpression results, results in the death of mice, but toxic effects progressively decrease in parallel to the reduction of the viral titer, with no obvious differences in survival between wild type and knockout animals. Here you have the data. Uh, the same data of the graph above, but split in wild type, which are the continuous lines, and knockouts, which are the dashed lines. And as you can see, basically, um, we found a similar survival for both genotypes. And uh, as you can see from this histogram, brain creatine levels remain higher than the physiological wild type levels, even diluting the virus. So maybe we are facing with an overload of creatine again. Uh, but since uh, for uh, the 1 to 40 dilution, we recorded a, let's say, low percentage of mortality, we also have some data about the rescue of the pathological phenotype at the behavioral level in P40 mice. Basically, you can see a possible tendency to a partial improvement of cognitive function in the Y maze, a little bit better in the object recognition task, and, uh, and in the Morris water maze with respect to knockout mice injected with the GFP carrying virus. And importantly, we did not detect the toxic effect in wild type animals, but here we still need to increase the sample size to draw any conclusion. Um, however, we cannot, uh, you know, you, we cannot feel satisfied by these results, considering the only partial amelioration of symptoms and the still present toxicity. So. Uh, since we believe that, that dissecting the possible mechanism of toxicity is fundamental in the path towards a successful gene therapy, I listed here a bunch of different processes that might be involved in the neurogeneration we observe and that we are now investigating. Um, basically, the toxicity um, induced by CRT overexpression might be uh, might be due to uh, the stress of endoplasmic reticulum, due to an excessive burden of uh, protein synthesis, or the inflammatory response uh, due to the presence of an exogenous antigen, or um, the, the, the osmotic, osmolytic action of creatine. Basically, too much transporter in one cell may cause uh, the entry of too much creatine, and this might lead to cellular degeneration. Or, uh, Another possibility is that we are facing a cell-specific form of toxicity because the expression of CRT is not homogeneous across the different brain, cell brain populations, uh, with astrocytes, for instance, uh, showing a very low or even no expression of this protein. Thus, we can hypothesize that an aberrant expression of CRT protein might, in astrocytes might cause degeneration of, the, of this cellular population. And our CAG and JET promoters are ubiquitary promoters. So this is an open possibility. Um, so we are testing these uh, alternative options, and our preliminary results suggest that the most likely uh, options are C and D. Indeed, markers of ER stress are significantly increased in the brain of animals injected with the full concentration of the, of the jet virus, here in, in blue, light blue. But this effect is already attenuated with the two-fold dilution, and we are now testing the um, the five-fold dilution. And also, the neurodegeneration induced by a local injection of the virus in the cortex of adult animals, uh, that uh, here you can see that the ipsilateral cortex where we performed the injection showed a very significant neurodegeneration, um, is not reduced by the oral treatment with desametazone and cyclosporin, which are, uh, which are two anti-inflammatory drugs that we uh, administered to the animals at high doses. Um, so um, on the basis of, uh, 
of these results, we are now studying and we are now working to the further optimization of the viral construct. And here you can see a list of possible alternative strategies that we have on the table. Basically, we are testing in vitro uh, in X cells and primary cultural neurons, um, different promoters, including PKG and the endogenous promoter of SLC6A8, which has been recently identified by the group of Gaia Salomons, with the aim to induce a lower expression of the exogenous gene at single cell level. We are investigating the possibility to attach a destabilizing domain to the uh, C-terminal of SLC6A8, which essentially increases the kinetic of declination and degradation by the proteosome of the resulting CRT protein, thus keeping down the expression level of the exogenous transporter. And we are going to assess a cell-specific approach using the synapsin promoter, which is a strong promoter targeting gene expression only in neurons, thus avoiding the astrocyte problem. Um, so to summarize, we found that the excessive level of creatine transporter and or creatine um, cause cellular degeneration. Thus, the therapeutic window for CTD gene therapy is narrower than expected. We found that the jet intraventricular injection at relatively low uh, titer partially improves the cognitive phenotype of knockout mice, and we are investigating the possible mechanism of toxicity and possible alternative strategies to optimize our therapeutic tool and maximize the positive effects of gene therapy in the hopefully next future. Um, so this is the end of my story for today. This is a list of the people which are part of uh, the creating group. I would like to thank in particular um, Elsa Girardini. Uh, Francesco Calugi, Federica Di Vetta, and Raffaele Mazziotti that basically performed all the experiments both in, uh, in mice and in humans for CNIRS. And these are the funding agency um, that made the, the research possible. And of course, thanks to all of you for your kind attention. I will be open to questions in the QA session later. Thank you, Laura. It was a great presentation. Uh, moving on to our last speaker in this session, um, I'd like to invite Dr. Jerry Lipschitz. Um, Dr. Lipschitz is a clinician and researcher from the David Jeff Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. He is a member of the Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Institute at, at UCLA along with the Broad Center and presently holds the Goldwyn Chair. His interests include liver and pancreas transplantation, as well as gene and cell therapies for single gene metabolic disorders of the liver. It is in this context that Dr. Lipschitz will be giving a talk today. Um, Jerry has also worked with the Association of Creating Deficiencies as a member of the Gene Therapy Consortium. Over to you, Jerry. Thank you, good morning. So I'm gonna talk about gene therapy for, for GAMP deficiency. This, is, this has really been my focus. So I think every speaker before me has spoken about the pathway, so I'm not going to spend any time on it at all. But other than to indicate that in, these, in this disorder, guanadinoacetate is elevated and creatine is, is decreased, which I think everyone is already aware of. So, uh, I know this is a, a, a mixed crowd, so I'm going to spend a little more time talking about the, the methods so that everyone really understands where we're starting from. So the, the concept in 2022 primarily is to take a virus and alter its genetic material to carry the gene of interest. So whether it's SLC6A8 or AGAT or GAMPT, you can take a vi virus, alter the virus, remove essentially all the viral genes and put in the genes that you want. That, that's really the concept here. So the prior two talks talked about this using the same type of viral vector. So the, the most common viral vector used in 2022 in the laboratory and in patients for monogenic or single gene disorders is a virus called adeno-associated virus or AAV. So if you have a dog and a dog gets a um, vaccine for parvovirus, this is in the family of parvovirus. So this is what we're talking about here, but this is a, a human virus that doesn't cause any disease, or it's generally thought of as not causing any disease. So on the top part is um, what the virus is like normally. 
It has these end components called ITRs, or terminal repeats, that help in the packaging of the DNA, the genetic material, into the protein coat of the virus. And it has these genes called replication genes at that end, in, in pink or purple, and then on the other end are called capsid genes that make up the protein, the protein coat. You can't generally, viruses don't just deliver the DNA into your bloodstream, it's protected in a coat. So you can get rid of those viral genes, the replication of the capsid genes, and inside you put what you call a transgene cassette. So if you just put the DNA in of the genes, so you put the GAMP gene in, it's not going to express, it's not going to be produced. You need something to turn it on. And so at the, in the, on the far end, in the green, is the promoter, a regulatory element that causes the gene to be expressed, to make multiple, multiple copies of it. At the other end, in orange, is something called a polyadenylation signal. It's a component that's added on to the, to the RNA, the genetic material that the DNA is made into, to give it stability. So you make this cassette of that, those components, your promoter, your gene of interest, and this polyadenylation signal. So you can change the promoter to get more expression or less, less expression like Laura Baroncelli was just telling us about. And you can use promoters from, from other animals, you can use promoters from viruses, you can use whatever promoter you want or been defined to give you more or less expression. And you can also use pro promoters to give tissue specificity. So if you want expression just in neurons, you can get expression there. If you want expression just in liver cells, you can get expression there. This is obviously not simple. It's taken decades and decades and decades of work for people to figure these things out. But this is what we're talking about here, is taking a virus that's out in the air, out in the community, out in people, out in animals, modifying it, and using it for a therapeutic purpose. I hope, I hope that makes sense. It's not the only way that people deliver genes. People use synthetic um, materials like the mRNA vaccine, vaccine that some of you may have, re have received from Moderna or Pfizer, that's a, a synthetic meth method of delivering genetic material. And that is used in, in, in for gene therapy also. But for viral vectors, this is the main virus, at least for monogenic disorders. There are, are again, other viruses used, but that's what we're talking about here. So last year, about nine months ago in September, so I did present some of this data, and I'm going to give an advance of this data now. Um, but we developed this viral vector here. So on the far end, in light blue, is a liver-specific promoter. So since GAMPT is primarily produced in the liver, it is produced in other cells, but primarily produced in the liver, we used a promoter that would limit the expression only to the liver. Then we have something called an intron, a regular, another gene component after that uh, promoter that increases expression some because we know we need a lot of expression. Then we have the, the GAMP gene in dark blue here, and we modified that gene. So it's the human gene, and we did some changes in the sequence to try to have it increase the expression more. We did something called codon optimization. There's these codes that every amino acid recognizes to be produced, and we try to enhance the expression, again, to know, because we know we need a lot of expression. And then we have this polyadenylation signal that's developed from beta globin, from basically from red cells. And then we have these inverted terminal repeats at the end. And the limitation with these viruses is you can't put a huge gene in it, or this cassette is limited in size. It can, it can maybe be up to about 5,000 bases, and the GAMP gene itself is about 1,000 bases. But overall, this entire cassette for us is about 2,400 base pairs. So it easily fits in here. And when we... Um, we delivered this, we did some testing on mice, all these studies are in mice. We injected it into mouse intravenously, the same kind of way we would propose that be done in humans at some point. And on, the, on your right side is, is a liver sample and every cell there, it, all, these cells are all represented and the cells that are expressing GAMPT are in brown. So this is a knockout mouse that has no GAMPT expression didn't show you that here, but each cell that has brown is expressing GAMPT. And then there's some background cells that are not expressing. But as you can see, probably 80, 90% more of the cells are expressing GAMPT. The protein itself is in brown. On the other side is the, is the uh, RNA, the messenger RNA that produces GAMPT. You can see the dots in pink that are present there. That's just to give you an idea of what we're talking about here. So we, we're trying to figure out the right dose, as like Lauren Baroncelli had mentioned, and what you can see here is on the far side is creatine, 
on the close side is guanidine or acetic acid. Our untreated mice are in red at the bottom. And as we increase our dose, we get more creatine in the blood. These are from blood samples from mice. And if we look at the guanidine or acetic acid in red, on this side over here, is guanidine acetic acid, it's high, and as we increase our dose, it becomes lower. And the dotted lines are kind of the threshold of what normality would be. So the higher the dose, the greater the correction. So what, what we did is then we injected mice. We took male mice and female mice, and we gave an intravenous dose, our highest dose. And we took the mice and we weighed them every week for 54 weeks. And the colors are the same throughout everything here. So in, in black, is the wild type, in red are the GAMP deficient mice. Okay, black is wild type, normal mice, red is the GAMP deficient mice, in blue are the treated mice. So they're GAMP deficient, treated with the virus to express GAMP. And on the, on, you can see, on, start with the females here, you can see the red over, those, over that year, the mice have some fluctuation, but they're smaller, they're, their weight is less. But if we look at the females and the, and the, uh, if the treated, and the wild type, the wild type in black, the treated in blue, we see that the weight catches up. At the beginning, the weight's a little lower, far end, and then the weight catches up to be basically equivalent to the wild type. There's no statistical difference. If you look at the males, for whatever reason, the, the wild type males continue to gain weight. The uh, treated males in blue gain weight, but then they more plateau. They don't reach the exact same uh, weight as the wild types, but they're definitely substantially more. I think it's very clear. They're, much higher than the red, which are the untreated GAMP mice. They get no therapy at all. And you can see the size down here. On the far side are the knockout mice untreated. In the middle are our wild type, and our treated mice uh, are here closest to me. So you can see they're similar in size with treatment compared to the, to the untreated mice. So I think here is the biochemistry. So we're looking at the blood uh, here in males and in females. And on top is guanidine acetic acid. Again, using the same color scheme uh, as before. Um, in guanidine acetic acid, the red is high in the blood throughout the year. In males and in females, the red is high. And then we have our treated mice, or we have our untreated mice, our wild type in black at the bottom. GA is low. We're talking about just the top two. GA is low all the way across for the year just because they're wild type mice, they're normal mice, you'd expect to be normal. But then in the treated mice, we see at the beginning, it's high. After 30 days, we measured only time zero and at time 30, so if we measured every single day, it'd probably be coming down over that time period. But we see at time zero, it's elevated, it comes down by one month, it stays down the entire year. We took, so normal mouse and the laboratory mouse, they live about two years, they can live a little bit longer. These mice don't die of this disorder, but after one year, the level has remained low. We euthanized the mice at the one year time point. In the females, we see something very similar. Um, uh, sorry, in the, in the creatine, we see something very similar on the bottom. We see in the red or untreated mice, the creatine in the blood is very low in both males and females. In the wild type in black, it's uh, normal. And we see then in, uh, in our treated group, it's low, comes up after one month, and stays up the entire time. There's some fluctuation here. It's probably due to when the samples were tested. They're not tested all after one year, all samples at the same time. Tam samples are tested each month, so there's a little bit of batch effect, I think, going on here, and that's why there's this fluctuation. But I think it's fairly clear that with treatment, the level is pr pretty much similar to the, uh, to the wild type mice. Then we looked at the urine. So in, in GAMP deficient mice, in the urine, the GAA is quite high, and the creatine is quite low, just like you see in the, in the blood. Here, the males and females are combined. If we look at GAA, again, in red is, are the deficient mice. The GAA is high. In the wild type, black bottom in the top graft is low. And then with treatment, the GAA comes down and is essentially normalized for, for the year in the urine. If we look at the creatine, we see a, a similar but the reverse pattern. We see that the creatine is quite low in the urine from the beginning, but with treatment, then becomes normalized or nearly normalized in, in blue there. So we looked at tissue levels. So we, again, we had groups of mice. We let them live for a year, and then we euthanized them. And what we see is uh, we looked at the creatine and the GAA. If we look at the kidney in the center, the, sorry, if we look at the skeletal muscle on this side over here to begin with, we see that the GAA is quite high in red in untreated mice, but it's essentially normalized in wild type and in the treated mice. We see the same in the creatine, we see the correction. If we look at the liver, the main organ for 
uh, gamped expression, you see that GAA is high in red and then is normalized. Same with creatine. The liver enzymes, so we look for toxicity from the viral vector. We look at the liver enzymes over that time period. We looked at four months out. The liver enzymes are normal. So we don't see any toxicity from the viral vector, at least when we look at four months. The, the one area that's a, a slightly disappointing is if we look at the brain. So if we look at the, at the far upper hand corner, if we look at the creatine levels, the creatine is essentially zero in the brain before treatment, but it's normalized then when mice are euthanized at one year. It's, very, it's identical to wild type. The GAA in red, far graph, is elevated and it comes down about 60%. So it's not completely normalized, but it comes down about 60%. And as I mentioned from the beginning, this vector only expresses in the liver. So what's probably in part happening here is some of the GAA that's in the bloodstream is entering the brain. And here, we're completely normalizing in every other site, essentially every other site. So we're drawing GAA out from the brain into the plasma, but then being metabolized in the liver. But what this does tell us here is that we do need some expression of GAA in the, of, of GAMT in the brain. We don't have that here because that's how we designed our vector for this first generation vector. But I think you'll agree that it is substantially lower, which we were happy about. So yesterday, I think um, um, Andreas Schulze talked a little bit about a biomarker. And he talked about, uh, briefly, about PET scans. So if you've heard of PET scans before, you might have heard it in, in the sense of cancer. Someone has cancer. They need to go in and see if the cancer is spread. They'll get injected with a radioactive material called 18-fluorodeoxyglucose. Uh, and it goes throughout the body, but it particularly goes to cells that are very metabolically active very metabolically active because there's glucose in this. So it'll go to those sites and you'll be able to detect, detect it. So if we look up here at the top, in the center, we see the brain in the circle. And blue is less metabolic activity, it's like a rainbow. Red is high metabolic activity. If we look in the center, you see that the brain has less metabolic activity. It's more towards the blue. If we look at the wild type on this side, we see there's more green and yellow and some red indicating more metabolic activity. Okay, so I think it's quite clear between the center and the far side that there's less activity in the center, which is the GAMP deficient. On the right side is the treated mouse. So we see more yellow, particularly green, we see a spot of red. Uh, again, just look within the circle itself. The quantitative data is over here. So again, the wild type is in red, the untreated GAMP is, excuse me, the wild type is in black, the untreated GAMP is in red, and our treated is in green. And essentially there's no statistically significant difference between the treated mouse and the wild type mouse, but there is a difference between the untreated and the center. Down here, actually we did a comparison, suggested actually by Heidi, that we look and see how much, what's the difference between uh, our gene therapy and creatine supplementation for the mice. And if we look at the data, the graph itself, we have regular chow, then we have creatine supplemented mice with regular chow, and then the gene therapy, again, looking at the brain by this PET CT imaging, and we see actually we have improvement in brain metabolism over creatine alone or regular chow. We did this in the final, final slide here. We did this behavioral testing, which can be a little bit confusing, but just to explain briefly, it's something called a Barnes maze, which was developed by a woman named Mary Barnes in 1979. It's very similar to that Morris water maze, but it's all dry. So basically you have this big disc, and on it are about 40 holes. And when you put a mouse on it, mice don't like to be out in the open. They like to hide. They like to be hidden. And so in, in one of those holes, you'll have a little chamber below. So they can look in and find that's a place that it can hide. The other one's just a hole. If it were to go through, it would fall through. So it, they look for that hole that, that has the chamber below. And you can have three ways of finding that. So over, and you do this process where they learn this over time. It's not just done once, it's done over days so they can learn where that special chamber is and it's kept that way every time so you don't move it around. It's in the same spatial cues of the room that they're in. And so the, the, you can have random, like what's represented in gray over here, is they just hunt and peck and find, try to find the spot. Or they can have zero where they go from one hole to the next hole to the next hole to the next hole to find it. Or they can have direct or spatial where they actually learn 
excuse me, the middle one was serial, excuse me, spatial, where they've actually learned where the spot is and they'll go back to it every time. And so what we found, these mice don't have a huge number of deficits they're, and they're fairly subtle deficits that they have when you do find them. But what, what we found is that over time, the mice will learn the GAMP deficient mice that are treated by gene therapy will learn so that it becomes similar to wild type and overcome these cognitive deficits that they have, this learning deficit, so that over time, looking over here, this last this tag, the, the untreated mice have more of a serial going, uh, finding time point, uh, finding mechanism to find that one chamber that they can hide in, whereas wild type mice and the treated mice have more of the, of the learning process to get there, they find it every single time at the same location. So their, their learning deficit is resolved or nearly resolved in these mice. So in conclusion, the AV treated mice thrived. We had sustained expression for at least a year. The plasma levels of creatine and uh, hyperguanidine acetic acidemia were resolved. The urine creatine and GAA are normalized. Uh, the, the brain creatine levels are normalized by what I showed you at one year, but the GAA is still uh, uh, somewhat elevated. Glucose consumption in the brain is normalized in the treated mice, and the learning abnormalities are, are also resolved or nearly resolved. I'd like to uh, recognize the group of people in my lab that worked on this with me and also recognize uh, Andreas Scholze, who's collaborated with me along with uh, someone in his lab, Alana Takikova, and then our collaborator at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. I'd like to recognize our funders, particularly the uh, ACD here that uh, helped us with some of these studies. So thank you. Sherry, thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, so amazing to see such promising results. Uh, Dr. Shulze, if you will join us as the moderator for this session. Um, and uh, we have our virtual speakers on the screen up here. If you could turn on your cameras, please. Um, as a reminder to the audience, our virtual speakers cannot see you. So if you could just introduce yourself when you ask a question, um, they will, I'm sure they'll appreciate it. Good. Um, so th thank you very much for all the speakers. I think we had four excellent talks and a lot of uh, uh, food for thoughts and questions, I guess. And we are a little bit a uh, challenge because I don't know how many minutes we have because we are uh, also We're, we're going to do um, if, up, up till 10.15. And for those individuals who would like to also grab coffee, please just step outside, grab coffee, and come back. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> so I... Um, I want to recapitulate briefly uh, what we uh, just heard, and this is uh, Laura, uh, Laura Duan Trio talked about uh, the observations that the group in uh, Lausanne made with uh, a uh, rat uh, knock in model for creatine def uh, transporter deficiency, and she specifically focused on uh, female rats in, in those observations, uh, what she reported to us. Um, Laura, I want to ask you one brief question. So I try to ask uh, brief questions and hope you get brief answers because I want the audience to, to have the opportunity to ask questions. The, the one um, question I have to you, uh, can you hear me, Laura? Yes, yeah. I can hear you. Okay, good. So um, it looks to me, and I, I don't completely understand, um, when you do the knock-in, that is um, before you get pups, and then uh, they can have a full uh, lionization, uh, different lionization, or uh, how does it work? And uh, because what I saw is, uh, the data you presented showed that the variation in your female um, heterozygotes, noggins, uh, was la much less than in other, in the other, uh, like uh, in the mutant or so. And I would rather op uh, expect the opposite if you have um, a um, different X inactivation and you measure metabolites related to uh, the gene defect, wouldn't you not expect to see a higher variation? Like in, in um, CDD females, you know, you can have no phenotype and you can have a severe phenotype. So there is large variation. 
but I didn't see this in your rat model. Uh, I don't know if I understood well the, <laughs> the question, but uh, we have, uh, I mean, we have a broad a spectrum of different phenotypes in heterozygous females. I mean, um, they can be normal or they can be more or less uh, creat brain creatine deficient, but also in their behavior, I mean, some of them can be normal, but depending on which is the test, and some of them uh, show, I mean, differences on that. I mean, it's not really an homogeneous group as homozygous females, they have um, more variability, but it's true that there are some, some features, for example, in, 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 in behavior, when we weight them, they were completely homogeneous, all of them in general. Yeah, and then I, I looked at yeah. the metabolites, for example, creatine, and there was less variation than in the homozygous group. Uh, creatine in in brain, uh -huh. creatine in yeah, and also the urine. Ur urine, creatine, creatine in ah, Asia. in urine. Um, yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, I think this is this is probably because of the yeah, maybe there is some kind of compensation in in the kidneys, or maybe there is a selection of the of the wild type version of the gene, or maybe it's because, I mean, at the end, the filtering is an accumulated process, so maybe at the end, all the creatine is, is finally recovered. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But it's true that in, in kidney, it seems that they, yeah, that they perform better as expected. Mm -hmm. It's not like the plasma creatine is true. That's true, I mean. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Gabriela talked about the um, AAV strategy uh, for creatine transporter deficiency in, in rats. And um, so the, the one question I have is that you basically didn't see any uh, effect on uh, urine creatine, creatinine ratio in those AAV treated rats and I wonder whether <clears throat> this is a, is a good marker because I'm assuming the AAV targets the brain and not so much the muscle and um, mm -hmm. so and, and I mean the the reason why we see this um, elevated creatine creatinine ratio is mainly because we, we don't get uh, creatine uptake in the muscle in a creatine transporter patient, so we have higher circulating creatine on the first end, and we have less creatine in the muscle, so we get less creatinine formation. And these two things together cause this um, increase of creatinine to creatinine ratio mainly. So if you have an intervention that does not target or change the muscle, you may not see much of a difference, even if you are highly efficient in the target uh, organ. Gabriella? Yes, I didn't. Uh, I didn't hear the finish of the sentence. So oh I, no! Uh, I, no, there was no. Sorry. There was no question mark at the finish of my sentence. <laughs> <laughs> so my question was: Could it be that you didn't see uh, much of an effect in urine because uh, your vector is only uh, is targeting the brain and not having an effect on the muscle? Uh, so you. You are asking me that uh, maybe the, the, the virus is targeting more the, the brain and not the, the muscle? Yes. Yes, uh, yeah, this could be, but uh, I, you, you told, I mean, you, you tell us that uh, you see, you didn't saw a difference in the creatine to creatinine uh, ratio in the urine, but what I saw, but what yeah. I, um, you did see any difference? I mean, then perhaps I misread the diagram. Yeah, yes, yes, we saw a difference. I mean, the chi injected animals with the virus have a decrease in the creatine to creatinine urine ratio. 
Oh, and we have okay. also, sorry. No, please go ahead. Ah, okay. And we have also an increase of creatine concentration in the plasma of our KI injected animals compared to the KI not injected. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, Welcome. Laura um, talked uh, about very important finding, and this is the gene dosage um, is, is very significant in uh, gene therapy for creatine transporter deficiency, and it is perhaps the most challenging aspect of uh, in the development of an efficient treatment. Um, so, and the other aspect that I also uh, found very interesting is the uh, NIRS uh, cortical uh, activity measurement and seeing differences, basically using this as a non-invasive method. So that's, that's excellent. Um, I did not completely understood. Did you already try patients with transporter deficiency or is this your plan? Uh, it's uh, it's in our plans. Basically, we recorded just a couple of patients. What we have seen is that uh, maybe we should improve a little bit more the, the experimental design um, because uh, I'm not completely sure that uh, the children were uh, looking with were, were focusing uh, uh, to the to the screen for the whole time of the experiment. Uh, and uh, well, we'll see what happens, improving a little bit more the, the room, the comfort of the room, the comfort of the chair, but also possibly the experimental design. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. And um, Jerry uh, talked about a very um, impressive uh, study um, on gene therapy in gum mice, so that's very promising. Um, and I mean, you observed that uh, gonadino acetate is still elevated in two organs. It was not only the brain, it was also the kidneys. And I think, um, to me, I don't know what you think, uh, that ex is explained by the fact that these are organs that have a higher expression of agat. So those organs are still producing gonadino acetate. And um, Obviously, if you don't increase the amount of GAMD in those organs significantly, there will be an accumulation, and this um, may, um, while in, in organs like muscle and liver, there is no high agat expression in the first place. So this is why you may not you may see a complete normalization because the circulating GA is not the problem anymore. Yes. Yes, completely agree. Thank you. And uh, I neglected to mention this is our first generation vector, and now we've developed a new one uh, to try to overcome limited expression in the liver, which was our design, but to have expression in other locations. Uh, kidney expression with adeno associated virus is very difficult, but I'm hopeful that we'll have some brain expression to overcome this. But we'll see maybe. We have so four, now uh, questions. Yeah, we have four <laughs> audience members, and I'm going to go uh, round robin to them. Please introduce yourself when you ask the question. Probably a bunch more. This is Guy Bogar, parent of CTD patient. Um, this first question is for Gabriella. Um, did you you had some pretty good results there? But did you see any behavioral issues with any of the mice? Any negative what behavior? I'm sorry. Any negative behavior issues from the injected mice? In rats. Rats, sorry. <laughs> uh, no, until now we don't see any any neg negative uh, behaviors in our rats. Okay, moving on to one more audience question. Dr. Louise Marbonzo from Paris. Um, uh, thank you for your impressive talk. I have a question for Dr. Gabriela. I'm wondering if you use the same ser serotype uh, um, adenovirus as uh, Dr. Laura Barocelli. This is the first question. And the second question is, what's about the biodistribution of adenovirus? So I don't think uh, they, we were, I'm using the same uh, uh, construction as uh, Laura Baroncelli is using. We are using the promoter that is the cytomegalovirus promoter. 
So this is a difference. But uh, and then for the biodistribution, uh, I don't know what you mean. You mean in different uh, tissues or PK PK studies, pharmacokinetic studies and, of your okay. We we didn't perform this, but it's a a nice uh, a nice tip to do it and to look at uh, for this. I have a question for Dr. Loa Baracelli. Uh, do, uh, do you think that the toxicity of uh, your adenovirus could be due to the dysregulation of the blood-brain barrier, as it has been reported for this kind of serotype of adenovirus? Um, yeah. Well, actually, we performed an experiment. Hi, Louise. Uh, actually, we performed a ex control experiment using uh, the same serotype of uh, AAV with, uh, um, well, with uh, the GFP protein, but also a channel rhodopsin protein, which is usually um, employed for, you know, optogenetic studies. And uh, with, within, in our hands, these two different proteins do not uh, uh, induce any kind of cellular degeneration. So. Our hypothesis is that the toxicity is specific of the exogenous protein in this case of creatine transporter. Um, and if I may, I guess that the serotype uh, is the same because it should be uh, AAV9, at least our is AAV9. Of course, the promoter is different. Hi, my name is Sung and I'm a parent of a CTD patient. I have a question for Dr. Laura. Um, you mentioned the overexpression is toxic. I wanted to know how much is um, too much. Um, do you, did you see a threshold for the toxicity? And on the other side, um, you know, you said the therapeutic window is small. And do you know what the uh, threshold is for the to see the clinical benefit? Then this is a great question. Um, basically, we are trying to do that. We are trying to understand which is the threshold. Um, needed for avoiding the toxicity effects and seeing the beneficial effects. So far, we did not identify the real threshold because we don't think that it's a threshold um, related to the concentration of the virus, but we think uh, the threshold is uh, of uh, uh, creating levels in single cells. We do not have, at least I do not have, um, tools for measuring, creating with the uh, resolution of a single cell level. And so this work is not so easy to do, uh, but uh, using the gas chromatography and mass spectrometry that uh, provides us, uh, you know, uh, creating levels in brain homogenates, uh, we are uh, trying to assess uh, combining this with the behavioral testing and uh, other, other methods we're trying to you know, to what uh, achieve the better uh, compromise between uh, the, the, the the creating expression, the creating transporter expression, a single cell level, and uh, um, a very high titer of the virus to uh, transfect the many cells in the brain and obtain uh, beneficial effects. Uh, you, are, you are right; it's a, a, an issue of, of threshold, but it's not so. It's quite tricky to understand which is the threshold, actually. Hi, so my name is Hilary Beggs, and I'm at Ultragenics. And I have a follow-on question to that and then an additional question. Um, it's interesting to compare the two of AEV therapies um, you know, with the different promoters, the first with the CMV promoter, the second with the CAG and SV40 promoters. But did you guys do any um, brain slice sort of imaging of cell death, you know, looking at individual at the individual cellular level that you could track over time? Because I think it's really interesting to address, you know, you may be, regardless of the percent transduction that you see across the brain, you may have a promoter that's driving expression of your transgene at a very high level in individual cells that's causing the toxicity. So I was just wondering if you guys looked at any markers in your brain slice that would overlay with your, you know, GFP or, you know, other markers of the virus itself? Uh, this is a great question as well. Uh, well, not yet, um, but you are totally right. The problem is that uh, probably AAV transduce uh, 
some cells with many copies and other cells with, I don't know, one copy. And this induces a very large distribution of the CRT expression in the across the different cells in the brain. Um, and a further optimization that we plan to do in the future of the viral construct is to in introduce a regulatory element using, for example, Mirna to avoid this uh, large distribution and to obtain a very, um, uh, a very uh, tiny distribution with uh, uh, many cells uh, expressing the, 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 the same levels of the transporter, possibly just one copy. Um, we do not have a tool like you suggested. We are now testing the transport, the, the, sorry, the virus in vitro in primary cultured neurons. Uh, but of course, the timeline is definitely shorter than in vivo. Great, thanks so much. And my second question is for Gabriella. Um, I was wondering if you would speak to your uh, decision to supplement creatine in your RAP model in addition to the AAV supplementation. And so I was wondering, did you do a control that was just creatine supplementation in your knock-in rat you know, that didn't have the virus so that you could determine the contribution of the creatine supplementation alone? No, we didn't have uh, this um, this control group, but uh, it uh, it will be nice to have this to just to have the the control. Thanks, Gabriella. We we are um, we have I think two minutes for this session to close. I have I have a couple more questions from parents and other audience members. I'm going to allow two more minutes or two more questions from parents before we close the session out. Um, well, in the uh... With regards to time, I'll try to make this brief, but Dr. Lipschutz and uh, Dr. Schultze, could you elaborate maybe just slightly um, with regards to what you already talked about, um, the GAA reduction of, of only 60% in the brain uh, as um, in comparison with the liver? I mean, you, you mentioned the GAMT uh, circulation. Could you elaborate just a little bit on that and then if uh, you know, Dr. Uh, Lipschutz, you said that that would possibly be studied in follow-on studies. Like, could you talk briefly about uh, how and if you would do that specifically? So, uh, regarding the second question, I, I would, you know, this was the kind of the proof of concept to see if it could be done at all. I will say that, you know, as you picked up already by the number of questions, you can tell the SLC6A8 is going to be a harder disorder to treat than, than GAMT. It, it just is. Um, but uh, I don't, uh, so the, the next steps for us and the steps that we're already pursuing are to alter our cassette so that we get expression in other sites. So as Dr. Schulze suggested in regards to your first question is that we need to have expression in organs that express AGAT. The first attempt was to express only in the liver to see if that would be successful in treating all organs, but it's not in treating organs where AGAT is primarily expressed like the kidney and also in the brain. So I think altering and I know that you, I tried to give an introduction here to make it easier for everyone to understand, but there's some other components that you might have picked up from here in the, the, the last 10 minutes, is that the viruses can be different in the sense that it's still AAV, but you can have different strains, what we call serotypes. And so in our second generation constructs, cassettes, we've altered the promoter to get expression out to other sites, including the brain, but also have altered the, what we call the strain or the serotype so that we're not giving, not having just expression, hopefully in the liver, but in those other sites. So we expand expression to other tissues, hopefully the brain and maybe the kidney, but also that's by altering the cassette but also by changing that capsid on the outside, that protein coat, to get it into other tissues, particularly the brain. The kidney is, a, is an organ that's been very difficult to have the virus go to in general, a word we call, call transduction. But that's the next steps. Those are the steps that are in progress now. Wow. 
hope that answers your question. So we are almost, we are out of time for this session. So unfortunately, I will have to close out our Q&A. I know that there are several members in the audience that still had questions. Uh, with your permission, virtual speakers, if you are OK with it, would it be, would it be all right for me to share your email with some individuals who might have no questions? Problem. OK. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks Thank a lot. You. Bye. Bye.